Hello everyone and welcome to Racing TV and the latest episode of My Racing Life. Today we have a very special guest. He has been for the last three decades one of the best sportsmen in Britain. He is still one of the best golfers in the world. He's won 44 professional tournaments, 25 on the European Tour. He's made 10 Ryder Cup appearances. Back in October 2010 he deposed a certain Tiger Woods to become the number one in the world. He's won professional tournaments across four decades in the 90s, the noughties, the tens and earlier this year he won the HSB Championship at Abu Dhabi. He's also a very successful racehorse owner with big wins on the flat and over jumps including the Cheltenham Festival and Glorious Goodwood. It is a pleasure to say hello today to Lee Westwood. Lee, uh, giving you the big build up today uh, to also marry up the fact that you're you <laughs> a, a racing man as well as obviously one of the best golfers in the world. First of all, tell us how you are, how you're handling lockdown. Oh, uh, not too bad really. I mean, uh, it's not that hard for me. I mean, we've got quite a big house and uh, a big garden, so uh, I'm, I'm just occupying myself in the gym. Um, it's trying to stay away from the fridge, trying to stay <laughs> off the red wine um, and, and, and be healthy. Where would you be in the world at the moment in the regular course of events? Would you be playing in Valderrama at the moment? <laughs> yes, probably. Uh, or, yeah, I think I probably would. I don't even know what day it is, <laughs> to be perfectly honest. Never mind what week. <laughs> Uh, how much has life changed for you through the lockdown? You're talking about, obviously, the fact that, you know, you've got a lovely house, big house. Um, but in terms of routine on a day-to-day -day basis, I guess guys like yourself who are accustomed to travelling, practising, playing and a normal way of life for you, you're having to adopt a, a different sort of routine now? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, my life's basically based around being on an aeroplane and traveling the world. And, you know, you just can't do that at the moment. It's irresponsible. So um, we've set up a gym in the house, uh, a net in the back garden. I hit balls in, but not very often because I'm not, not a big practicer anymore. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's it, basically. You know, I'm getting out of bed a bit later in the mornings because there's no school at the morning at the moment. And... Uh, the more you sleep, the less you have to do and occupy yourself during the day, don't you? <laughs> I like that. I like that, uh, that, that formula for success through the day. Sleep through most of it. Um, tell us a little bit about the impact yeah. uh, on the lockdown, on the, the pandemic, if we're serious for a moment about the impact. For God. We understand, obviously, it's a wider uh, aspect to everything and, and the serious nature that it, it is for everybody. But for the sport of golf, how much has this affected uh, the, the grassroots level all the way through to professional? Well, it's affected all of it. You know, golf's closed at the moment. So, um, you know, golf courses are closed. There's interaction with all sports, isn't there? And when you think about a golf tournament, people coming in from all over the world and flying in and, uh, you know, the people watching coming from all over the world as well and the close proximity of everybody even though it's an outdoor sport um it still had a had a profound effect on it and you know right now it's more important that people are safe so uh you know everything has to close down absolutely let's let's talk a little bit about your your love of horse racing as well lee because obviously a lot of people will know that you've been involved with horse racing as an owner for for quite some time now but when did you first get a, a taste of racing maybe you could also tell us when you had your first bet because you do like a bet yeah i think uh i think my first taste of horse racing was pretty much like most other people's you know watching the grand national or um, the King George on Boxing Day, um, you know, round at my granddad's, having a having a little twenty p sweep, picking a horse out, uh, being encouraged to it that way. I think. And what was it about racing? Given the fact that you know, when you were growing up, reading about you, obviously you 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 uh, were quite skillful at golf from an early age, but you also were into into rugby and other sports. What was it about racing in particular that that uh, tickled your fancy? Uh, well, I like a bet, but obviously that didn't happen when I was a young kid. But I think it's just the uh, the athleticism of the horses and, the, you know, the finely tuned, aren't they? And, uh, I like watching any sport with, you know, it's done well and, and the jockeys are 
and you know, also as well. Um, later on in life, you start to get involved and you learn how good the trainers are and what effect they can have. Um, you know, it's, a, it's just a great sport, great occasion to go to as well. Uh, was it a, always an ambition that when you could afford it, because a lot of us when we're growing up who, who can't afford it, uh, always think that maybe one day when we can, we'd love to be able to own horses. Was that something that, that came into your mind? Uh, yeah, I mean, um, you know, it was one of the first things I bought. I think I, think I bought actually. Could so uh, twenty. Okay. Well, we may, we may take a pause there, Lee, for just a second. Obviously, uh, despite the fact that prior to going on air, we were able to see Lee making a cup of coffee for his other half uh, without any problems whatsoever, typical. Uh, we're just going into a moment where we're going to uh, try to reconnect properly with Lee. In the meantime, uh, we will have a look at the first horse on Lee's list, and we're heading to a horse that did brilliantly both over hurdles and back in the day on the flat in South Africa, including at Kenilworth. They homeward bound now with 600 metres left to go and Classic Ruler has the lead. Brother Jason up on the outside. Badger's Drift poised to have a crack at them. He's creeping closer at every call. Badger's Drift now coming forward to pick it up in the derby from Classic Ruler. Princely Affair along the inside. Grand Jetta is hooked out deep. He's also starting to get into the race. Classic Lord along the inside's a big runner. Badger's Drift now being challenged by Grand Jetta, who comes forward along the outside. Classic Lord is back along their inside. Grand Jetta, Classic Lord along the inside. Badger's Drift trying to come back only. It's going to be close. Grand Jetta is going to win the derby. Grand Jetta, the winner from Badger's Drift and Classic Lord. They were followed along the inside by Princely Affair. As usual, with perfect timing, Lee, you're back. Uh, Grand Jeté winning the Cape Derby back in 2001 <laughs> uh, in colours that you shared at the time with uh, Chubby Chandler and Jeremy Hindley as well. Um, can you recall your memories of that success? I was actually down in South Africa at that time, playing in a Dimension Data, I think. And uh, I, I ended up just about finishing my round at Sun City and uh, and getting in to watch it on TV. I mean, literally, Simon McCard and ran in, <laughs> ran in front of a TV. Um, and, you know, that was an incredible horse, Grand Jetty. Um, you know, it, it did so well in so many different places. At, oh, you know, over hurdles on the flat. Um, we had fun with it over uh, hurdles at Cheltenham, I think. Aintree. Um, it went to Dubai. It ran at Ascot. It was it was a really top quality horse. Yeah, he. Uh, this was back in two thousand and one. So he was part of your early success. So how did that relationship come about? How did you think? Yeah, I wanted to own a horse and own a horse in in South Africa. Uh, well, Chubby sort of got me involved with that. I think uh, Eric Sands trained mm. trained that one, and then in South Africa and then it, and then he went obviously to Dubai I think maybe Mike Decock trained him there I'm not sure maybe it was still Eric um, I think he ended up at Nicky Henderson's yes he did end up at, at Nicky Henderson's because of course he took you to the Cheltenham Festival and actually did quite well in the county hurdle had he not made a mistake at the last he might have finished a bit closer uh, this is back in 2005 so four years after he won mm. the Cape Derby where were you at this moment I can't remember, but knowing me, I was probably playing in the Players' Championship or Bay Hill or something like that in the <laughs> States. It's this golf, it gets in the way of racing all the time. <laughs> uh, you, you, would you have backed Grand Jetté in the county hurdle that day? I think I probably did. That mistake at the last was uh, was crucial. To, to he, he ended up finishing fourth there. Um, he was a horse that actually came back uh, and ran well at Cheltenham again, uh, having finished fourth in the county hurdle. Um, I guess when he went to Dubai with Mike Decock, as you rightly say, things never worked out for him. Can you recall the thinking about, you know, for a horse that won the Cape Derby to end up running over hurdles for Nicky Henderson, how did he end up there? Uh, 
Um, I think it was just the distance he was running running over at uh, in South Africa and then in then Dubai and then obviously when he came to England it just it just fitted well to stick him over hurdles so we popped him over them and so I took them and he jumped nicely so uh, it just seemed like a natural thing to do. I think he 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 started at Bangor if I'm not wrong and he got beaten by a a horse called Grand Champetre that I think yes. JP McManus ended up buying and. And running uh, quite a lot, especially at Cheltenham. Yeah, God, God Champetra, that's right. Um, he was owned by the Million Mine Syndicate and then JP God bought him Petra, yeah. for, for a lot of money. But you managed to win at Wincanton mm. with Mick Fitz aboard. A uh, bit of a touch that day when he won? Yeah. <laughs> Just a knowing I smile. I think probably, yeah. <laughs> um, what was the, because obviously this is one of the first big successes for you, 2001. <laughs> What's the feeling like for someone who's experienced so many highs already? You were one of the top golfers in the world back in 2001. What was, it, what was the difference like to have a big success in a race, say, for example, like the Kate Derby? Well, when you're, when you're a golfer, you're in control. You're, you know, you're doing, you're doing it. So owning a race horse is completely different. You know, you, you're not in control. The jockey and the horse are in control and, uh, it's a lot more nerve-wracking. I get a lot more nervous watching a horse than I do playing golf myself. That's extraordinary to hear because obviously you know, you're know you in pretty nerve-jangling situations when you think about it. Um, and what about the difference between flat and jumps? Yeah. There's a horse who did two things. Do you get nervous watching the horses for their safety as much as yeah. for them doing well for, for you and, and the owners? Yeah. Yeah, it's always nice when you know you're putting them over jumps or hurdles for them to come back safe. That's one of the, one of the main priorities for me. Let's talk about because obviously Grand Jetté managed to uh, travel the world for you. Not only was he successful in the the Cape Derby in South Africa, you mentioned he went to to Dubai, um, and Dubai has been the scene of um, some significant success for you over the years with with racehorses. The the relationship with with Mike DeCock in particular, if you could. Tell us about you know when you first became involved with Mike DeCock as a trainer. Uh, whew, the years are all blending in a little bit, Rishi. But uh, I think I first met Mike on the golf course. Actually, I think he came to watch me play in the Desert Classic or something like that. Um, I think I maybe bumped into him in South Africa, but uh, and then he said, "Why don't you get a horse in Dubai?" and uh, myself and Chubby ended up owning them with a shake over there, whose name escapes me. His colours were yellow with a with a blue uh, V on, uh, chevron on. Um, that's right, yeah. And uh, and we owned a couple with him. Um, we owned another one called Tyson as well, if, if I remember rightly. Um, um, there were, there have been a few. Um, we've been quite successful, and it's a great night out in Dubai when you go to the racing. We, 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 norm, we, we normally have a look at the draw from the golf because it's Thursday night to see whether they're <laughs> out early or late on the Thursday so we can get to the racing on a Thursday night. Well, the 2004 uh, Dubai World Cup night uh, provided uh, Lee Westwood with one of the best successes of his career. Uh, he had to share the spoils in the end, but it was a dramatic race. The Dubai GG Free, the horse right approach. And right approach last into the straight with 500 metres left to go. Refused to bend. A half length in front of Martillo. Crimson Palace on the rail looking for the way out. Nayir's gone up to be fourth. Followed by Sarah Fan. Check it on the fence. Evolving Tactics looking for the way through. Bright Sky stood a long way back. Martillo's hit the lead from Nayer 200 metres out. Then refused to bend. Paolini and right approach down the outside. Nayer in front. Right approach is zooming at the end. End. Right approach coming hard. Paolini lunged. Oh, thriller in the duty free. Uh, magnificent finish. Uh, what were your thoughts watching that race with Paolini and right approach making ground on the outside? Well, I can't see the pictures on uh, on this th this that we're doing now. Um, and listening to the the comments. I can run the race in my mind and he was he was last coming around the bend and into yeah. the straight and I just thought oh he's left it too late and it still gives sends shivers down my spine uh, listening to the commentary when he 
he came blasting through and it ended up being a dead heat, I think. I think the other horse was from Germany, if I'm not wrong. Correct. Yeah, Paolini. Uh, right Approach used to be yeah, owned by... Yeah, I mean, it was just incredible. I'd... Used to be owned by Her Majesty the Queen, uh, when with Sir no. Michael Stout. Then ended up with, with Mike. How did yeah. you get into that? Was it, again, That's right. ch Chubby or someone else leading you into that? Yeah, Chubby and, uh, and, and Mike, they just said, you know, do you want to be involved in this horse? Uh, you know, and yeah, I thought, why not? You know, if it's good enough for the Queen, it was uh, <laughs> it was good enough for us. Absolutely. Oh, he's a pretty smart horse. Was, we had a, fun, I had a funny conversation. Sorry, you go ahead, Lee. Sorry, I had a funny, I had a, I had a funny conversation. Uh, the Ryder Cup team from 2004 in Detroit got invited to the Palace and the Queen's racing manager was there and he pulled me to one side and, and we had a conversation about right approach. <laughs> I hope it was a pleasant one and he was congratulating you on the great success and how well you'd done with the horse since it raced for Her Majesty. Yeah. Something like that. And <laughs> <laughs> um, he, he was pretty smart because he came back the following year and he finished third to Elstrom uh, in the next Dubai Duty Free. But even beyond that, I mean, he stood at stud in South Africa. Did you did you keep an interest in him once he'd retired, or did you um, did you just let him go off to stud? Yeah, I just let him go off to stud. I, I didn't keep an interest in him. No. Have you ever been interested in the breeding aspect of of racing? No, not really. It's just uh, too, it's too expensive for me. That. <laughs> um, just on the on the subject of Her Majesty the Queen. Obviously, she used to own Right Approach, but years later, you'd you'd be back at at the palace to receive an award yourself, an OBE. Um, how how special was that? Oh, I was brilliant. I'm a big fan of the Queen and uh, and and the royal family and. Uh, it, it was just a, a lovely occasion for for all my family, and uh, um, she, she she's amazing how she can strike up. A, I know she's obviously practiced it a lot, but it's amazing how she can strike up a conversation, and and you know, she's really interested in the individual. Um, she's a she's a fantastic lady. Absolutely. How important is she for the for the sport of horse racing? Do you think? Oh, very. I mean, you know, it's. Uh, I love going. I love going to Royal Ascot, and it's it's just so special because she's there. And you know, when one of her horses has a chance, it's uh, there's a real buzz around the place, isn't there? <laughs> uh, particularly like when Estimate won the the Gold Cup. I think uh, a few a few people will always remember more than mm. a few people will always remember remember that day. Um, Wai Chong Marwing was the the successful jockey on uh, on, on Right Approach, and then again rode him the yeah. following year when he was third. Um, as a as a sportsman, we often talk about golfers, for example, learning from other sports or vice versa. Horse racing, trainers, jockeys. Is there something about training horses or being a jockey, for example, that you think uh, is something that you find particularly ad you admire in, in others? Uh, well, definitely with the jockeys, it's the discipline, you know, the... Um, you know the, the way they keep themselves fit, and and also their fearlessness. They must be very strong mentally to to do what they do. Um, and then the tr the trainers, you know, understanding the horses so well. You know, the horse can't tell them anything or speak to them. Um, you know, it's it's a real craft to be able to understand what's right for the horse. I, I, it still mystifies me. <laughs> uh We've touched on the fact a few times that uh, you, you know, you've been a pretty successful punter over the years. Um, quite a few headlines in the papers of big wins at Cheltenham, for example. Uh, what was it a two hundred and forty pound stake, winning forty eight grand, etc. So clearly, clearly, a good punt excites you. So I'm going to take you to Dubai again, January. Yeah. 2013 and we're going to watch a race at Maidan, a handicap and we're going to have a look at a horse who once made the pace for Frankel in the 2000 guineas but now racing for the Lee Westwood ownership group, rerouted.
Van Ellis out by two and a half lengths. Lockwood being chased hard in second spot. Peter Tear third. Then First City rerouted trying to come off heels. Followed by Silver Ocean, Nordic Truce and St. Bernard to the outside. But Van Ellis said, come and catch me if you can. And with 300 metres left to go is five lengths in front. Rerouted is doing the chasing. Followed by Peter Tear. Freewheeling, starting to storm down the centre of the track. Van Ellis is tippy-toeing. 75 metres out, rerouted's coming, rerouted will get him, rerouted goes home too well, and rerouted has won. So that horse rerouted, winning in January 2013. Now, you were in Dubai at the time for the Desert Classic, is that right? That's right, yeah. Yeah, I was. Mike de Kock obviously being the clever trainer that he is, uh, obviously knew you would be there, that, that, that this race for rerouted. So did everybody put two and two together that there was a, a, a plot to win that race or had Mike said to you, <laughs> when you come out for the Desert Classic, Lee, rerouted's going to win? Uh, he may have done, yeah. <laughs> I think there were a few, I think there were a few please caddies that night. I may have... I may have passed the tip around the driving range earlier in the day. Uh, Mike was pretty good at getting a horse ready for a big day. Yeah, well, actually, that was a tremendous training performance. Um, as you said before, he was the pace setter for Frankel, and he'd always been used to just going out, blasting out in front, and, uh, and, and then horses coming past him. So, you know, mentally, he'd, he'd never, that never been good for him. Um, so to actually get him to come past horses was something completely new for him. So it was a real brilliant training performance on Mike's part. And talking about, you mentioned the caddies would have been all happy about that. I mean, are there a lot of people in golf, other players, mm. caddies, etc., that are, are quite interested in the sport of horse racing and therefore tap you up for tips? Mainly the caddies, Fishy. Um, there's a few players that have uh, owned shares in horses. Uh, I think Jamie Donaldson may have owned a share in a horse with Michael Owen. Uh, trying to think of a few others that don't come to mind. The, the worst thing about that night when rerouted one uh, was Christophe Tumion getting off him, walking past me and giving me a full-on crack across the backside with the whip. <laughs> what was that about? Just, I don't know. Just, I, I, I'm glad he only did it once. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you didn't like it. Uh, no, not much. <laughs> <laughs> well, here you are with Chubby receiving the trophy uh, on, on this occasion. <laughs> um, no, no tie for either you or Chubby. Or the, or the presenter. No, it's a very casual night, isn't it? It is. It's great fun, though, as you, you rightly say. Are you the presenter? <laughs> right. yeah. uh, he came back out later on at the carnival as well, rerouted and won in March. He won a, a carnival handicap. Yeah. Have, you, have you got the trophy there behind yeah. you? That's it there. That's it there. Magnificent. Yeah. Uh, so how, how special were those two wins for that horse with obviously that ownership group and, and Mike Decart and Christophe Sumio? Uh, really, really special, obviously. I mean, more special for the horse. I, I, I really felt for the horse, you know, always being just a, he had a lot of ability, obviously, um, just being a pace maker all the time and never having his chance to win. No, then he all of a sudden had his big chances to win. Can you remember that year? Uh, and, and a great jockey, by the way. I was going to ask, before we get into the jockeys, going to ask, um, obviously that year, yeah, 2013 Dubai Desert Classic. Can you remember where you finished? No. You did, you did pretty well. <laughs> you did pretty well. You tied fifth. Can you remember who won it? Oh. Oh. Uh, Alvaro Quiros. Stephen Gallagher. By three oh. shots. But, but not bad. They won it back to back, didn't they? Yes. Um, Christoph Sumio, you've obviously been associated with lots of top trainers, lots of top jockeys. You, you just mentioned Christoph Sumio being a great jockey. What is it that you think about Christoph Sumio that makes him so good? 
I was always amazed by his cool and calmness and his great timing. All those all those jockeys have fantastic timing, knowing when you know when to produce the horse just at the right time. And he's he's a bit of a golfer as as well as Mike. Have you ever played golf with both Christoph and Mike, or mm. either one or the other? I played with Mike. That's an experience. <laughs> uh, I, haven't, I haven't played with Christoph. What? What's the you thing about Mike? You have to be careful Mike? with Mike because he's a bit of a bandit. He is a bit of a bandit, and also he doesn't give you any putts, uh, which I found to mm. my cost um, out out in Dubai on a couple Nothing. of occasions. No, um, but he he's always been the type of player, the type yeah. of person who enjoys life away from the race course. Um, he loves obviously playing golf, loves his barbecues, etc. At uh, at his stable in Dubai. Have you found that with Mike? That's something that you you share, being able to enjoy things away from your professional life. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the beauty of uh, horse racing. You know, when you're a golfer, you, you tend to be worried that anything you do can get you injured. Um, and one of the things you can do is, uh, is horse racing. So uh, I think that's what's always attracted me to it. And, you know, Mike obviously is a great trainer, and he, but he's even good, he's even good at, uh, at timekeeping. He trains the horses really early in the morning, and then he has all afternoon to practice and play his golf and barbecue. <laughs> And how important do you think that is for any professional in any walk of life to be able to, to balance what they do for a living with being able to have some sort of life away from it, uh, which is something I think, I guess, people in, in the pressure cooker like you are should, should enjoy? Yeah, I was given some good advice when I was a little boy by my granddad, and he said, well, if you're going to work, work hard, play hard as well. So, you know, I've always tried to, you know, commit myself 110% to work or, you know, golf, uh, do my best at that. But, you know, when I, when I switch off, um, I, I go away and I try and enjoy myself as much as possible and take myself away from golf. You, you mentioned your, your granddad. Oh, we're going to talk about... I don't take anything too seriously. That's always a joy. You mentioned your granddad. We're going to talk about other members of your family a little bit later on yeah. in the show for, for obvious reasons. But while we have the chance to talk a little bit about your love for, for sport as you were growing up as a, as a young lad um, and, and how, how you, you formed a particular ambition to be a golfer. Uh, yeah, I think like most kids, I played a lot of uh, different sports when I was a kid. Uh, I, I was a pretty good cross-country runner, um, decent footballer, played a lot of rugby, uh, cricket. I tried to do everything, decent swimmer. I think all those things were useful in sort of building up my body equally. I, I'm a bit, I get a bit worried nowadays that kids start to play golf a little bit too early uh, and they commit themselves to one sport. And then, they, you know, golf's such a... Uh, you, you use your body in just one way mm. and uh, you can develop injuries and stuff like that and I see these young kids at 16, 17 years of age with bad backs and things like that and I think that's because they haven't developed their bodies enough when they're younger by playing other sports so I was really glad I did that and I, you know, I got strong all over my body before uh, I actually took up golf and then I took up golf about the age of 12 or 13 just through watching... Uh, uh, Mick Faldo win the Open, um, Jack Nicklaus win the, win the Masters. Um, and I got hooked because it was an individual sport and, you know, everything that happened was all because of me. You know, it wasn't team sport where I was relying on other people. Uh, and I like the, I like the mental aspect, aspect of it as well. It really challenges you mentally. How do, the, how do those challenges mentally change over time? Obviously, when you're young, you know, winning your first tournament, I think back in the, the mid-90s, 1996, to 2020, winning in Abu Dhabi. You know, people think, or they, they kind of assume that things change with you, life, professionally, personally. Does it, does it alter the mental approach on a golf course and in practice? Yeah, very much so. Um, you know, especially um, when kids come along and families, you, obviously priorities change. Um, but also when other experiences happen, you know, you, you have highs and you have lows um, and you've got to kind of handle the, the knocks well. Uh, you know, I've had, a, I've had a slump in my career and, you know, obviously this, they, they get scarring from that and you have to overcome that. Um, 
and all these you have to take into account. You know, as you get older, you know, there's more things that have gone on in your life and, uh, you, you know, you have to find a different way of approaching things. Hmm. Going back to the racing, Lee, and you talked earlier on today about the scheduling and how you often, you, you have to, to, to base everything around golf. Are you then, once you know what's happening around golf, do you then look for opportunities to, to maybe fit in going racing after you know your schedule? Yeah, yeah, I put the major championships, uh, uh, the World Golf Championships, and then and then Cheltenham in. <laughs> uh, well, we will talk about Cheltenham a little bit later on. Uh, a very, very big meeting is the, what well, used to be known as Glorious Goodwood. Um, and if we head back to July 2011, arguably one of the most impressive victories in a handicap, courtesy of Hoofit under top weight in the Stewards' Cup. So Nasri on the stand side with Tiddly Winks and also in that group is uh, Dock of the Bay and High Standing. Meanwhile down the centre, Evens and Odds leads over there with Fitzflyer tax free. Who fits prominent on the far left also coming through his Global City with Secret Asset. Faster behind them with Quest for Success. Jimmy Styles, Ancient Cross as they make their journey. Now still with a good furlong and a half to run. Tiddly Winks under the near side. Out in the centre is Nasri. The yellow cab of Evens and Odds tax free. Who fit on the far side? His right front rank with the leaders at the moment. Who fit in the pink jacket from tax free still staying on his nasri on the near side max power is coming home strongly but who fit under this welton burden is a group horse in a handicap and will win the stewards cup it really was a magnificent success top weight stewards cup obviously one of the one of the mm. toughest races to win uh, of of the season uh, yet he was he was backed pretty strongly that day um i'm guessing that you and uh, a few of your friends yeah. a few caddies as well would have enjoyed that yeah he was heavily back that day <laughs> yeah talk, talk us through the build-up um, to that no, race. i mean the commentator had it right he was a group he, he, he was a group horse um in a handicap uh, to win with that way. I mean, great jockey on board, Kieran, um, and and he he powered away from him, didn't he? So uh, it was it was an unbelievable performance. Great training performance by the legendary Mick Easterby. Yes, we've spoken about Eric Sands in South Africa, Mike DeCock in South Africa. Now we're talking about Mick Easterby preparing uh, Hoof It for you in, in the Stewards Cup. When did you first have contact with the legend that is Mick Easterby? Do you know, I can't remember when it was, um, unfortunately. I think it was at Doncaster or York or somewhere like that. He doesn't like to go too far, does he? No. Although I think he bought a new suit for that trip down to <laughs> Goodwood there. I suspect it was free. Um, uh, what did he tell you about Hoofit going into the Stewards' Cup? You didn't really have to say much. Um, you know, he's a big, powerful horse. Um, and you could just tell from, well, he made the trip, so he must have had a good chance. And Mick, as a, as a trainer, uh, he often, he's, he's, he's infamous for, for wheeling and dealing. Um, the, the whole Hoofit experience, I'm guessing, as soon as Hoofit crossed the line, the first, when he'd won the Stewards' Cup, uh, Mick was trying to sell you a few more horses, was he? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely, yeah. I think... I think uh, yeah, and he's not changed. He still tries to do that. He's, I've still got a couple with him, and uh, every time he calls, I know it, you know he's trying to sell me a, a, a bit of a horse or a whole one. After Hoofit won the Stewards' Cup, Lee, as Richard Hoyle said in, in commentary, he was seemingly a group horse in a handicap. He narrowly lost out in the Sprint Cup at Haydock to, to Dream Ahead and Baited Breath. It looked as if... Sprint Cup at Haydock. Looked as if he was going to win that race. I guess that was quite a, a painful defeat because he, he looked to have every chance in the final furlong and horses were running around a bit. What was that memory like for you? I was in Switzerland, I think. Um, and once again, just around just finished in time and I managed to get it on in the uh, scoring turn. Um, and I thought, I thought he was going to win. I really did. Uh, but beaten by... Two fantastic horses, obviously. Um, just ran out of steam a little bit at the end, didn't he? Did, did he hit the front a little bit too early, maybe? Possibly. I wouldn't blame the jockey. 
not at least on, on air. <laughs> um, but mm. he, he, he went very close. No. I mean, it was a fantastic race. No. And you say beaten by some very good horses. Um, yeah. It was surprising then that he didn't win again until yeah. September 2015 at the, at the age of eight. Um, but the following season, 2016, he had an amazing Indian summer. Obviously, he'd come down in the handicap. But uh, when we spoke, you, you, you in particular wanted to mention that Stewart's Cup consolation race at Goodwood in uh, 2016. Perhaps you could talk us through this success. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how many horses have done that, actually won the Stewards Cup and won the consolation race as well. But it's, you know, every credit to him to, to, to do it. And uh, it just shows he's a bit like me, isn't he? Isn't he? He's got the, the longevity, uh, he's still doing it as he got older. 100% correct. And I guess that's one of the things that we like about racing, uh, which obviously uh, we like about our best golfers, is the fact that you're around long enough that we can appreciate the things that you, you did, you once did. And when you can repeat it again, it gives a little bit of the old magic back. So to see him win must have, I'm guessing, given you an enormous amount of satisfaction at the age of nine. Yeah, I mean, hugely. I mean, you know, I think I think the British public sort of, I suppose, with me having a part ownership in him, grew attached to him, and uh, um, you know, they they really had a soft spot for him. Um, it was a great name as well, wasn't it? Hoof it. Um, I think he was named after watching one of our football teams play football, and all they ever did was hoof it. <laughs> not not Forest, is it? I think it was Bolton Wanderers. <laughs> Uh, now, Nathan Evans, who was aboard uh, Hoofit when he won in 2016, uh, he, you, Mick Easterby, had a pretty good 2016 during the summer, if I remember correctly. Uh, do you know, it's a long time ago now, Rishi. I, I, I can't remember, but I'll, I'll, I'll trust you if you say we did. I think we did, yeah. Well, it seemed, seemed like uh, my account went up. <laughs> That's normally the best way to judge it. But to help but jog your memory, I am going to take you to the Scottish Sprint Cup of 2011. And this time, hoof along. Red Baron and Thesmere the first two. Tangerine Trees now giving chase with See the Sun and then on the near side Kimberella who's in a share of fourth. Hoof along is next. Driven along is Robot Boy. Trying to make ground is Sylvanas. Confessional. Judicial over towards the far side. So too Fast Track is trying to come on. Jigga Ferenczi did not get any room with a furlong to go. Thesmere has now bagged the rail and has now got the lead. Staying on his Hoof along in second and then Robot Boy and Jigga Ferenczi. It's now Hoof along and Nathan Evans down the centre of the course. Thesmere on the near side but it will be Hoof Along who is going to win. 16 to 1, Hoof Along won the Scottish Sprint Cup at. Mm. Did you back him that day? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> basically, do you back every horse that I think races? I backed him in from about 25. <laughs> so, do you basically back uh, every time your horses run, do you back them blind? Yeah. No, nothing wrong with that. Yes, I do. Yeah. Um, and what was I'm stupid. What was oh, Mick's confidence no. like for that race? <laughs> yeah, it was pretty good. Um, we, we thought he had a chance. Um, I, I love going to Muscle, but I didn't go that day. I must have been playing golf or something like that. But uh, it's a lovely little track. Uh, I've been there to watch a few races. Uh, Muscle obviously lends itself to uh, horses that they tend to excel on it. A lot of course specialists in this, but Hoofalong got through, got the gap under Nathan Evans. I said he'd ridden Hoofit or was go going on to ride Hoofit when he won this consolation race, getting up to win here. You've touched on Musselboro. Perhaps you could give us a, a little bit of a, a Lee Westwood guide to your, to your favourite race courses around the country. Oh, I mean... I, I used to love going uh, to the small tracks, you know, like Thirsk and Beverly, Pontefract and places like that, Ripon. Um, but I, I love York. I think York's a fantastic track. I like going to Cheltenham, obviously, for the festival. I love going to Ascot for the Royal Meeting there. Um, I've been there in winter as well. Uh, we had a horse called Poker School that won there at Ascot. Um, 
Yeah, there's so many good tracks, but I do like Musselburgh. Um, I, I was living in Edinburgh for a while, and uh, and it was only 20 minutes away, and it was nice to just drive along, and you can park close. I like it when it's easy. <laughs> okay. Uh, the next horse that we're going to talk about is one that I'm particularly looking forward to uh, hearing from you. It's uh, an amazing occasion, a horse that Lee purchased for his dad, John Bally Alton, winning at the Cheltenham Festival. They're freewheeling down the hill then. They've still got two more fences left to take Bally Alton and Brian Hughes have cruised alongside Double Shuffle. Alu Momo is back in third, just momentarily outpaced here on the turn. Followed on the inside then with every chance Willow Saviour being driven. And then comes Bouverill from a mile back Resorby and 12 Roses on the outside. Bridget's pet with a say two probably over the second last. Two independent fallers, Willow Saviour and Resorby. Resorby was running on and uh, Willow Saviour looked beaten. Here's the final fence now, three in a line here. And on the outside, it's Bouvril who comes storming through with Bally Alton and double shuffle. Bouvril on the near side, Bally Alton on the far side. What a finish. Bally Alton gamely responding, takes up the running again. And Bally Alton and Brian Hughes are going to last it out for the Ian Williams team. Bouvril in second, followed by double shuffle third. Bridges Pet fourth, 12 Roses and Alumomo. Well, before we talk about the memory of that success, Lee, let's just have a little bit of the background to the colours this horse raced in. Obviously, uh, you bought him as a present for your dad. Can you tell us about when you first told your dad that you'd bought a racehorse for him and you'd got some colours made for him? Um, yeah, I did buy it for my dad for Christmas, so I, get, I got the colour. I got the colours for him as well. Uh, and I gave it to him on Christmas Day, and he opened the box, and he said, I'm never going to fit in those. <laughs> um, and he'd always wanted to have a racehorse, and uh, uh, and there it was, a, a, a racehorse. I think I paid uh, 33000 for him, and uh, Ian Williams uh, trained him. I think he'd won his point-to-point -point in Ireland quite convincingly, and Ian really liked him and thought he was going to be a special horse, and he proved to be a great horse. Um, he just lives down the road. Uh, still, so uh, he's still uh, he's still got some speed. The the lady that rides him um, says you, you you know you have to be on your guard with him. But you know he's a he, he's a lovely horse and he uh, what a what a warrior as well coming up that hill at Cheltenham that day. So lovely to hear that uh, he's enjoying his retirement. Um, so you you purchased him for your dad. He did pretty well as a as a novice hurdler. He actually finished second to Faheen in the Neptune uh, Investment Management novices hurdle but then he missed yeah. a, he missed a season through through injury so what 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 happened to him after his novice hurdling campaign uh i just left it to ian really you know i, I know very little about horses and uh you know ian said he needed some time off so he gave him a rest he said he was too good to um you know to take any chances with and uh so we we decided to give him the rest and uh and treat his injury properly and uh, and he came back strong. We, we always thought his future would be over fences rather than hurdles. He had a fall going in to or the, his race prior to the Cheltenham Festival. He fell at Ascot. Mm. So what were the expectations like heading to Cheltenham on, on the day of his race? Well, you never know what to expect, do you, when they've had a fall? You know, it, it can affect them mentally. Um, they can be injured and you can't you sometimes you don't notice it but uh, it wasn't the ideal prep but uh, um, we still uh, Ian still thought he was in, in good nick and uh, you know we were very hopeful for, for Cheltenham When Bouvril headed you at the last what were the emotions like on the run up the hill? That's as nervous as I've ever been watching a racehorse um, I I I just had a strong feeling that he was going to finish strongly and, and win. Uh, were you sharing that experience with your dad on the day? Yeah, we were stood in the uh, um, the, the enclosure at uh, Cheltenham there, watching it on the big screen, um, and I was just bouncing up and down. I, I couldn't believe it. It was uh, it was the end of a long day at Cheltenham, and uh, I can't lie. I'd had a few drinks. Uh, and it was the ideal way to finish a day and, and you know, so pleased for my dad and Ian, you know, having, having given him a year off for it all to come right. And uh, uh, great for Brian as well, the jockey. Um, you know, he gave him a great ride. 
you look pretty well if you've at the end of a day and you've had he's a gone on to prove that he's a he's a champion jockey yeah congratulations to brian hughes we're seeing a picture of you and your dad and at the end of a long yeah. day we're, we're you actually looking in pretty good nick considering that's the adrenaline <laughs> <laughs> Bit about bit about the relationship about you and your dad because I, I didn't look I didn't I I understand I didn't I didn't look so good about six hours later on I can tell you <laughs> uh, when when you started playing golf Lee your dad also started playing golf at the same time if if I'm right in what I've read um, and obviously you yeah. you came up I think with quite a yeah. an amusing quote that your dad got down to fourteen and you became the world number one. Yeah, we started on the very same day at uh, Kilton Forest Golf Club, and uh, and, then, and my dad obviously saw that I was pretty good at it, so he took me for lessons. And pretty much every lesson I ever went to, he stood behind me and watched me. And I thought he was taking it all in what the golf teacher was teaching me. But when I turned pro, uh, you know, when I was nineteen, and you know, he was still off eighteen or something like that. And about two thousand and ten. I got to world number one and I said, Dad, where did it all go wrong for you? You know, you went to every lesson, you got down to 14 and I'm world number one now. <laughs> it, it sounds like a, a lovely relationship that you, you've had with your, with your dad. So that moment at Cheltenham when Bally Alton won, uh, obviously, you know, you've had some amazing moments as a professional golfer and it's sometimes unfair to ask for a comparison, but in the life of Lee Westwood, how special was that? Yeah, it's in the top ten that you know to be able to lead a horse in at Cheltenham uh, with your dad is uh, and you know do all the uh, the stuff afterwards with the presentation and everything and going in the the like the winners' room. Um, it, it's incredible. I don't get much better than that. And if we look, if we can cast uh, cast our minds to the future, your son Sam is uh, turning his hand and showing a great deal of promise as a golfer. How's that going? Because I I understand <laughs> that he's knocking it past you occasionally now. Yeah, he, he's a pretty good pretty good player. I mean, he's still got a lot to learn, obviously, and. Uh... Um, he does occasionally hit it past me, or he used to. Uh, now I've learned that if he hits a good one, I just pull the three wood out and say I'm playing for position. I don't even chance it. <laughs> uh, would, what would you? Would, are you the type of parent that that allows him to do whatever he wants, and you don't want to to funnel him in any particular direction and let him make his own choices? Yeah, he's got to be his own man and, uh, and you know, find his own way through life. Um, you don't want to be uh, compared to anybody else or, you know, I steer him in the right direction. I bought him a horse, actually, for his uh, 18th birthday, so I'm steering him into horse racing. That's very good. What, what, what's the horse and, and where is it? I, I named it. It's called Sam's Call and uh, it's, it's with the great Mick Easterby. Brilliant. That's a beautiful story in itself. Yeah, you'll <laughs> have some fun with that. The first trainer that your son's got a horse with is Mick Easterby. That's a pretty serious start that you've given him in life. Yeah. In at the deep end, Rishi, that's called. <laughs> Uh, I want to come on to the, the one remaining horse on the list, uh, Lee, and uh, we're going to a horse named after a famous sporting venue, and quite an interesting story we'll hear about very shortly. Her name, Augusta Kate. Forge Meadow and Kate Harrington with the lead, chased by Augusta Kate and Patrick Mullins. Then comes Don't Kick Nor Bite and Declan Lavery. Copper K runs on towards the inside ahead of Glenn's Harmony, and these are clear. Now they race towards the final furlong. It's Forge Meadow with Augusta Kate digging down deep on the near side and is challenging and has hit Forge Meadow, racing now towards the finish. And it is Augusta Kate and Patrick Mullins in the lead as they run towards the line, and she's going to make it third time. I'm lucky at a big spring festival and a day two treble for Willie Mullins, Augusta Kate. Magnificent success for Augusta Kate. Uh, before we get into her performances as a racehorse, uh, Lee, uh, a little bit about the origination of her name. Yeah, it's a good story. It came about uh, at Augusta. 
Um, I was there with, and my guests that week were uh, Alan Shearer, Graham Wiley, and Anton Deck. And we discussed that we should maybe get a racehorse. And it came from Ant going in the... Well, they first, first of all, Ant and Deck carried for me in the Par 3 tournament. And then uh, Ant decided to go to the pro shop and buy some souvenirs after that. So he went down to the pro shop and he was pretty much buying everything. And he took it to the counter and put it down in front of the lady, young lady. Uh, and she looked up at him quizzically and she said, you remind me of somebody. And he thought, you know, it, 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 not popular in America. We don't do any shows over here, but, you know, maybe she recognizes me from TV or something like that. And she says, you remind me of a friend of mine. And he thought, oh, yeah, Kate. <laughs> so it was a girlfriend of us. And, uh, and uh, we decided to call it Augusta Kate, named after, named after Ant. Oh, brilliant. Uh, and she turned out to be a pretty smart horse. Um, she actually went off favourite for the bumper at uh, the yeah. Cheltenham Festival. Yeah, she got black tie. Yeah. Um, what about that success? You were, were you there at, uh, at Punchestown when she won in 2016? Yes, I think I was. It's all a blur now, is she? Uh, but I think I was there, yeah. Yeah. Um, what was it? I'm trying, to, I'm trying to remember. I've been there for, for, one, of the, for one of the wins, yeah. Uh, I think it was that one. She won at Fairy House uh, the following year. She won um, yeah. the Mayor's Novices her over hurdles. But I'm hoping that we might see you in the picture somewhere <laughs> to, to prove that you were there. Um, I, how good a horse do you think she was? Because she had some... Oh, there you are. Yeah, you are here. You were there, Lee, in Punchestown. Um, how good a horse yeah, was she? Yeah, I was there. I thought I was, yeah. Another long day. <laughs> um, how, how good a race mare do you think she was? Because she had some, a lot of races she started favourite for, a lot of very good races. Yeah, I think uh, I think sometimes she was unlucky. Sometimes the ground didn't go uh, go right for her. Uh, she came up against a lot of uh, good opposition. I remember her running against Apple's Jade one day. Mm. Might might have been her last win. Uh, so you know she, she she was a very good mare, and um, I think we she, we ended up selling her when she was in foal. Uh, so she's she's a mum now. Another another horse with a, with happy retirement. We certainly uh, wish you the very best. A um, little bit of time yeah. before we we close things off today, Lee, and I just wanted to talk to you on the theme of uh, Augusta, because uh, obviously you were going to be back at Augusta uh, back in April uh, for the Masters, having missed the last couple of years. But things have changed with the schedule. Are you are you happy with the schedule, the way things look on the on the world scene, both the the PGA Tour and the European Tour, with the three majors that remain taking place at the end of the year? Well, I think everybody's just trying to do the best job they can. Um, you know, there's there's not really too many options. You know, nobody knows where this virus is going to go and what's going to happen with it. So. Um, it's all hypothetical at the moment, but, you know, plans have been put in place, which they have to be. Uh, the Masters will be very different, played in November. Obviously, the weather will be very different. It'll be cold. Augusta is long now if it's warm, but, you know, if it's a bit chilly, there'll be some, some long holes out there, and uh, you don't know how the greens are going to be, and it's going to be a, a new experience for everybody. Yeah, a, a few of us uh, who who like to have a, a bet on the golf would be interested to know just what you're saying about uh, Augusta and how things might be different uh, in November. The other major sporting event in the world of golf that there is some debate about is, of course, the Ryder Cup this year, due to be played at, at Whistling Straits. And um, what do you think about the potential of a behind closed doors Ryder Cup? Uh, well. For me, the crowd have always made a Ryder Cup. You know, the, I, I, I find it difficult to picture it with uh, with no fans there. Um, you know, holding that winning putt and you know turning to an empty stand. Uh, you know, seeing the scenes on the first tee as everybody tees up, it just it just wouldn't be the same. I don't think. A lot of people are saying that exactly what you're saying that the Ryder Cup is made by the fans. 
But what about the necessity to, to give people a sporting event of that magnitude just to be able to enjoy a, a, as golf fans, as sports fans? Yeah, well, it's a difficult balance, isn't it, Rishi? I mean, you know, people are, are going to be bored right now and going to be wanting things to watch. And we're, we're part of the entertainment business, aren't we? All sports are part of the entertainment industry. And, uh, you know, it's one way that we can, uh, you know, get the country back on its feet. And we, it, it's a tough one. Um, you know, people are dying. Uh, so sports got to be low priority, mm -hmm. but at the same time, um, you know, it is one way of restarting the economy and, you know, giving people a boost, I suppose. Yeah. Um, a lot of a, a lot of sporting events obviously have been cancelled and in the, on the European tour in particular, obviously, Lee, a lot of events have been cancelled. Um, I, I think, according to the schedule, the next scheduled European tour event is supposed to be the British Masters held at Close House, uh, hosted by a certain Lee Westwood. Any, any news if that's still in the pipeline yeah. that it might take place behind closed doors or is it still all up in the air yeah i think it'll be behind closed doors i'm pretty sure of that but uh, yeah it's supposed to be the first one on the schedule so uh, it'll be a the, hopefully be a great way to restart the, the european tour season and uh, you know there, there'll be a few things in the pipeline uh, to run before it and along with it that'll uh, to do a few things for charity and uh, obviously everybody in the, the healthcare uh, front line um, to try and help them and give them a boost. Um, so with a bit of luck, yeah, it will be the first one on the schedule in uh, in July. OK, fingers crossed, Lee. Uh, before we, we tidy things up, just a, a little bit about, because you are involved. Yeah. We know you still have lots of horses and obviously we'd be looking out for Sam's call. But you're involved with the, with the Albatross Club as well, who have quite a few horses of, of interest. Um, anything that we could look out for when eventually, fingers crossed, racing resumes? Um, I think probably Miss Honey Ride is the uh, best prospect. Um, you can always spot the Albatross Club at any race, mate. We've got really bright yellow ties <laughs> and uh, and pocket squares, and uh, we're probably the ones that look the worst for wear as well. Uh, but it was uh, it was the brainchild of Ross and uh, Ross and Andrew Hardin from Your Golf Travel, and uh, it's been pretty successful. We bought some really good horses. And we wish you more luck with the Albatross Club. But also, Lee, um, you've encouraged us to believe that there's still a lot of success to come from Lee Westwood. With that success of the uh, HSBC, HSBC Championship in Abu Dhabi, uh, fourth in the Honda Classic, uh, how positive are you feeling about what you can do once things start again? Yeah, I'm very positive. You know, I've used this time to work on my fitness um, and strength and lose a bit of, lose a bit of weight. Uh, I feel mentally strong. I've been doing some good work with my psychologist. So, uh, yes, let's hope the saying life in the old dog yet is, uh, applies to me. I'm going a bit grey, but still got it when I need it. Well, we're all a little bit greyer. Uh, Lee, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, it's been a real pleasure to talk racing and golf as well. Uh, we wish you the best of luck. Stay safe in lockdown. Thank you very much to our special guest, Lee Westwood, on this episode of My Racing Life.